Hello you guys, welcome back to my channel. Please go ahead, hit the like and subscribe button if you're new here. Um, I just wanted to caveat before we start this video that very shortly after filming, we found out that there was a MAGA extremist who actually had uh, the Secret Service found out that he was stalking around President Obama's house, the Obama's house in DC. Um, I mean, he had all types of weapons with him. It is absolutely insane. It's absolutely atrocious. Um, I recently made a video entitled Every American Needs to Listen to This, and it is about how we must combat these seeds of fascism that has sprung up since Donald Trump has come into the picture, the main picture of politics. It's more important now than ever. Guys, please don't allow yourselves to be silenced. Um, but with that being said, let's go ahead and get into it. We'll talk about this more. Hey you guys, it's your girl Nadja and welcome back to my channel. So for a while here, and if you're new here, go ahead, hit the like and subscribe button, hit the bell, that way you know whenever I post a video. For a while, um, and you know, I've talked about this on my channel, I have just been absolutely overwhelmed with confusion about how America has essentially gotten to the point that it's at today. Why is everything so divisive? Why is everything so hateful? Why is everything so bigoted? Why is everything so immersed in conspiracy theory and corruption? The only singular factor, you know, that could make this much change, of course, over time, bigots are going to be there, racists are going to be there, misogynists are going to be there, transphobic people are going to be there. That is history. History is riddled with that. But what has made it explode to the extent where all of this, you know, white supremacy and bigotry and racism and misogyny and homophobia is rampant across the internet? What got us to this point? The singular factor that I can keep coming back to that has as much impact, you know, as much impact to make it as dire of a situation today that it is, is Donald Trump. It's the only thing that I can keep coming back to. But recently I was thinking about it and I was thinking, can it really just be Donald Trump? You know, what what was the point that got us to Donald Trump? What was the issue that brought us to Donald Trump today? You know, how did we go from Barack Obama whose tagline for his campaign was hope, whose campaign who I worked on, you know, who I went around doors, knocking on doors, you know, who seemed to bring America together, who seemed to have everyone's interest in heart, you know, not just black people, but white people, Hispanic people, anybody, any people, you know, it is the colonists, the colonizers, and the enslavers who literally invented race in the first place. We're just one race. We're just a human race. But we can't speak in those terms today because America emphasizes race at every second that it gets. And I thought, well, he was advocating for everybody, for men, for women, for LGBTQ, for climate change, for immigrants, for the American people. The American people, all of the American people, especially those black and brown ones who have been at the target, at the helm of persecution, because that is why America was founded. It was founded to benefit a bunch of rich white men and have that be created through slave labor from black and brown people and exterminating the, the Native Americans that were already living there. So I thought, dude, how did Donald Trump get elected in the first place? You know, what, what happened to get us there? What, what was it that got us there? What took us from Barack Obama to Donald J. Trump? And I started to think and I was like, it was Barack Obama. It was Barack Obama. Because history repeats itself, you know? People don't want to look at the 1619 Project because there's too much pride in the place. But you look at the 1619 Project, I hear things that I've been hearing my whole life. But I, I how do I want to say this? I can assume a lot of people have not heard that, namely Caucasian people in the U.S., because there's a huge level of denial. People don't want to talk about race, but at the same time, 
black people and brown peoples are persecuted. It's ingrained within American society. And now it's bloomed and spun out of control, but people don't actually want to look at history as it is, you know? And, th and not even just that. Say you don't want to say history as it is. How about history from a perspective outside your own? Because you could grow up in a family that literally are descendants of slave owners, of the Confederacy, you know, and you think today by standing up for things that society would label as far-right extremism, that you're, you're just speaking from the perspective of yourself and your people, and fair do. I mean, I can't say completely fair do, because that's bigotry, and I'm, you know, but if you say that, then why can't you listen to other perspectives? Because your perspective coming from a lineage of slave owners and Confederacy members, you know, Confederacy um fans, fans of the Confederacy, won't be the same as someone who comes from a lineage of slaves, you know, and comes from a lineage of people who fought for women's suffrage or fought for uh, the African Americans to vote in the U.S. And so I thought back about uh, the 1619 Project and the SNCC, you know, the 1619 Project talks about the SNCC volunteers, and I think it was Mississippi, and they marched up, and this was in the 60s, they marched up to the voting rights place because back then, the same way in 2020, where they tried to do all this weird rerouting that uh, mostly af affected black communities, you know, and that essentially limited voters' rights, you know, it, it made it harder for black people to vote and thus easier for Donald Trump to get elected. Um, that's not the first thing that, that, that's not the first time that that's happened, you know, and the 1619 Project shows the SNCC volunteers in Mississippi, I believe it was Mississippi, please don't quote me, they're going up to the voter registration office. This is a team of volunteers, at least 10 or 20 young black people, young black activists who are advocating for people to vote. They go up there, they say, oh, well, the, the, the poll, um, poll managers are, are at lunch right now, so you're going to have to come back. They stay there. They all get arrested and taken to prison. And not only are they taken to prison, they're taken to prison and they have dire, dire things done to them, you know, withholding of food, making them stay in solitary confinement in their own feces and urine for days, being hung up by their wrist, you know, by the ceiling, all for trying to vote, okay? And let me remind you, black people could vote in the 1800s. This was when it was passed for black people to be able to vote. And in the 1960s, Police were dragging black people away for trying to vote. But, of course, they were saying it was because they were soliciting or insubordinate or whatever made-up thing that it was. So, if you also see in the 1960s, at the helm of the, you know, the bus riots and Selma, Alabama, and, uh, you know, the, the SNCC incident that happened with the March on Washington, um, with the Harlem riots, um, with the 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 um, people being sprayed by hoses and things like that. Then we get into the 70s and, the, you know, the 70s are essentially um, the fruits of that labor. You know, we see a lot more diversity and inclusion and love and um, advancement in terms of diversity, advancement in terms of uh, integration and unity amongst all races, all cultures across America in the 70s, right? And then you go to the 80s and you got Ronald Reagan and, and Ronald Reagan is nothing compared to Donald Trump. Like I say at this point now, we kill for Ronald Reagan. I think in place of George of, of Donald Trump, we kill right now for Ronald Reagan. We kill for George Bush. But who knows, if they were in 2023, maybe they'd be doing the same crazy stuff. But my point is, is that, um, oh, and also look up those three core activists. I talk about it in the Daniel Penny uh, video that I did some time back uh, a couple weeks ago. Look at that. Uh, there were also in the 1960s three core activists, uh, two white men and a black man, who were um, doing the same thing, advocating for civil rights, advocating for black people to vote. Uh, advocating to end the police brutality, the KKK brutality that was happening to uh, black people. And these were white people who were also happening, sort of the equivalent of the abolitionists back in the 1800s. And the KKK killed them. And the police department of this town that they were killed in 
basically green lighted it. You know? And that was in the 60s. So the 70s were the fruits of that labor. And then you see now, I think, okay, so we had our first black president. We had this beautiful African-American couple in the White House who, at the core of themselves, were warm, inviting, relatable, you know, um, advocating for all Americans, made some incredible strides in policy, you know, more people insured, more people with health care than before. And then we got Donald Trump. I'm like, what the heck happened? What brought us to Donald Trump? It was Barack Obama. It was Barack Obama. It was Barack Obama and seeing more and more brown and black faces and, and places of power and that, that sinister um, backbone, that spine of America that exists, that's founded on white supremacy and racism that goes all the way back to slavery and colonization, sprung up again. And it's going to keep springing up until people really pay attention to this pattern. It's going to keep happening. We have to transcend this pattern as all types of people. I see this as a black woman married to a white man. You know, we have to all work together to transcend this pattern. I'm going to read you an article in a moment, but... Um, I quite literally was watching the 1619 Project with my husband, and um, when we watched it, they were talking about the Great Replacement Theory, you know, which where this is why a lot of this chaos has sprung up is because people, white people are so uh, bothered and intimidated and scared about the fact that the world is becoming browner and browner and browner and browner. This really should not be a point of contention and fear because this is where we came from I literally was discussing this with my husband this is where we came from look back at Neanderthals look back at hominids look back at the early human beings they were basically all one shade of tan you know we lit my husband and I literally looked at our arms pinned up together and we were like yeah like a little bit lighter than me a little bit darker than you that's that's basically what the what the planet was and then people adapted people traveled to different areas different countries and you know those neanderthals or or early human beings that were in europe their noses got slimmer you know to avoid the harsh cold european air their skin didn't need as much melanin so the the melanin in their skin adapted and et cetera, et cetera, the same. Those who rest in Africa, they stayed with the melanin in their skin. Their nose, their nostrils were wider to take in more of the air. You know, the 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 Asians, the 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 Latin Americans, that is all the fact that we have races today exists because we all essentially evolved from the same thing. And now we, we don't have control. People, I mean, we live in a day and age that is so secular. And okay, if that's your belief, great. My husband's atheist. But when we become so attached to this idea that we have all the answers, we have all the knowledge, everything's individualism, if you can just try, we forget about God. God is the decider. We didn't create all this. God did. And, and if you're atheist, okay, so what? And flip out God and say nature. Nature created this. Evolution created this. Same thing. It wasn't us. It wasn't us. It's not us who is eliminating the races. It's just the natural process of things. But people like Donald Trump has taken something so simple as human nature and turned it as a weapon. It's been turned as a weapon. So yes, you might see more people across the board becoming tan. But that is not in our control. It's the natural flow of human life. And let me remind you, we just think that we are like the hottest thing on the planet since sliced bread. Human beings are 200,000, 200 million years old. 200 million 
I just said 200,000. Even my brain can barely wrap around that. And I'm sitting here trying to talk to you about it. 200 million years old. We are a mere speck in the timeline that is history. Yes, we're becoming tan across the board. It's no reason for people to become crazy fascist. So anyway, it was Barack Obama. It's been Barack Obama this whole time. Um, I had to, I had to scrub back for this, you know. I had to scrub back for this. So this is an article from The Guardian from 2020. And even though this is a dated article, it's so relevant now because if you don't know where you come from, you don't know where you're going. And the biggest thing of far-right extremists, the biggest thing of white supremacy at this point, you know, like I, I loved it on the Roland Martin channel the other day, one of the co-anchors said, we should all be really suspicious when a bunch of white men are saying that they are receiving racism. <laughs> and it was so true. I was like, yes, yes. You know, and there's a few woke white people out there, like Donald Trump's own niece, Mary Trump, who are willing to attest to that. But um, when you're silent about it, across the board, all people, all races, when you're silent about it and you forget about your humanity, you forget about human compassion, that goes out the door. But these far-right extremists want to say, I don't want to be judged for what my ancestors did. And I'm sure black people don't want to be judged for what their ancestors did. It's like... What kind of what kind of education did you receive where they taught you that you can move forward and do anything, have any sort of future if you don't understand your past? What, 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 please tell me what, what accredited university gave you that education. It wasn't. It was crazy far-right conspiracy theories that have been um, agitated by Donald Trump. I urge my Republican friends, you know, I, I, I know people who are Republican, people who are just, I love them just as much as my Democratic friends. I don't think it's your fault. I think that you've been duped. Please, please, please listen to somebody. Please listen to somebody who is outside of your echo chamber. Please. So this article is from The Guardian. It's entitled, It Eats Him Alive Inside. Trump's latest attack shows endless obsession with Obama. This article breaks it down really, really well, and I'm going to stop a lot to discuss, but still, let's go ahead and dive in. This is an article from the 16th of May, 2020, and uh, this is written by David Smith. So it says, President Barack Obama and President-elect Donald Trump once sat together in the Oval Office. I was immediately struck by Trump's body language, wrote journalist John Crawl in his memoir, Front Row at the Trump Show. Mary Trump was speaking on this, saying that her family was so intertwined in white supremacy subtly, but of course they probably wouldn't define it as that subtly. As so many people who grew up in families, you know, white families that came out of the 50s, the 60s, and even going further back to that, you know, the 20s and the 30s, um, white supremacy and racism was really just a part of everyday life, you know? It wasn't really until recently that we really started putting our foot down and saying these things are not socially acceptable anymore. And so she was saying, you know, she had heard Donald Trump say the N-word, you know, on occasions. It didn't surprise her. She didn't know about uh, her grandfather being arrested at a KKK rally, but she essentially expressed that she could believe it, that it wasn't a surprise to her. This is the roots of where this is coming from. Keep that in mind. So let's keep going. It was November 16th. The article resumes. It was uh, November 16th, and just for once, Trump was not in charge of the room, Carl recalls. Obama was still president directing the action and setting the tone and we know that in terms of diplomacy in terms of actually being a politician altogether barack obama is a whole other animal he also is not a narcissist or a sadist he's actually capable of compassion and emotion um so it says his successor seemed a little dazed and a little freaked out what the two men discussed in their meeting that day, only they know. 
And I, I, I really, really was drawn by the mystery in that line right there. What the two men discussed in their meeting that day, only they know. And that was back in 2016. I think that something really sinister has been brewing here for a long time. And I think that Donald Trump has had a vendetta to wage with the whole world about his insecurity, you know, his fragile masculinity, his fragile sense of self. And that has been reflected back out to the world. And those who have similar ethos joined on the bandwagon. It goes on to say, but what became clear in the next three and a half years is that Obama remains something of an obsession for Trump, the subject of a political and personal inferiority complex. The article goes on to say observers point to a mix of anti-intellectualism, racism, vengeance, and primitive envy over everything from Obama's Nobel Peace Prize to the scale of his inauguration crowd and social media following. Donald Trump and went and created his own social media following. It's like you can see the way his stupid little cartoon evil villain mind works. He's like, oh yeah, Obama. <clears throat> So you think you're so cool, huh? I'll go create my own social media account. I'll go create my own social media platform. I like how they use the word anti-intellectualism uh, anti because the MAGA Republicans have done something that's so sinister. And it's, it's not black people who have fallen forward. It's actually poor whites. And this is what really disappoints me because they've been duped. And I really hope that they wake up to sense that they're ruining their lives. They're putting their lives on the line for the sake of this orange man. And I hope that they are able to rescue it and save it before utter detriment happens. But, you know, something that you saw from the MAGA Republicans over the past seven years that Donald Trump has really been at the forefront of politics is that they tried to get you, stop getting you to educate yourself. They, they try to stop getting you to read certain books. They try to defund the museums like Candace Owens so idiotically suggested. Um, they try to say, hey, you know, back in my day, the, the strong, strong white people basically were the ones who were working out in the coal mines, who were working in the labor industry. Okay, and, and yes, that holds some, some, some value. But also look at how much the archetype, the, 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 the landscape of education and the workforce has changed today. Look at how much of it has become digital. And you have politicians telling you, don't learn about digital. Don't learn about algorithms. Don't learn about uh, coding. Don't learn about design. Don't learn about the way that websites work and the internet works. Don't go in to be engineers. Don't go in to be uh, marketeers. Don't go in to be designers. Don't go in to be communication analysts. You know, keep going after the mining jobs, the coal jobs, the labor jobs, even though those jobs are disappearing more and more and more. Do you see the common factor here? But Elon Musk is super duper rich. Donald Trump is super duper rich. The people who are supporting them are very poor. Anyway, so it goes on to say Ben Rhodes, a former Obama national security aide, tweeted this week, Trump's fact-free fixation on Obama dating back to birtherism, I don't know what that is, birtherism, I have to look that one up, is so absurd and stupid that it would be comic if it wasn't so tragic. I see. This is coming back to that whole um, controversy around Obama's uh, birth. You know, the stuff about his birth certificate. And you know, this is how insidious this stuff is. It didn't really click to me until recently that Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans were really behind that. Because at the time, I dismissed it as fake news. You know, back in 2016, 2017, when all of that stuff was coming up, I was like, oh, that's just silliness. But now, I see. You know, it's the same thing where, over the years, many of these celebrities that have been canceled, a lot of them being African-American, I just thought, oh, well, they were corrupt, you know? 
But then in the past few years, as I've really looked into these patterns more, I thought, no, they, they weren't that bad. They weren't that bad people. There was um, a targeted effort behind getting them out of the way. And when I go on channels like Roland Martin and Indisputable with Dr. Rashad Ritchie, and I see people calling these men racists, you know, now I can't be duped. Now I'm like, oh, I know exactly who you are. Calling this black man, calling out injustices against black people racist. I know exactly who you are. Um, so it says birtherism was a conspiracy theory that Trump started pushing back in 2011. So this was way even before 2016. This has been slow brewing. I've talked about many times on this channel, you know, somewhere around that 2015 mark, um, the America I grew up in changed, you know. Um, it says he doesn't have a birth certificate. He may have one, but there is something on that birth certificate. Maybe religion. Maybe it says he's Muslim. I don't know. That's a quote from Donald Trump. Nine years later, he has come full circle with Obamagate, which accuses his predecessors of working in league with the deep state. People out there who've been radicalized. If you hear deep state and you're saying to yourself, well, the deep state is real. It's true. I really, really encourage you to go get some help. Go get some help. Go get some psychological help. Talk to your family. Get to church. To a church where people are not pushing these same conspiracy theories. But I know that if you are listening to that and you heard that and it resonated with you, um, great. If it didn't resonate with you but you do believe those things, I know what I said just went in one ear and out the other. So, Um... Which accuses his predecessor of working in lead with the deep state to frame Trump for colluding with Russia to win the 2016 ele uh, election. Trump colluding with Russia is all his own doing. He is a sadistic narcissist, you know. The article goes on to say there is zero evidence for this claim. Indeed, a case could be made that the supposed deep state did more to help Trump than hurt him when the FBI reopened an investigation into his opponent, Hillary Clinton, just before Election Day. Wonder why that was. When questioned by reporters, Trump himself has struggled to articulate what Obamagate means. The same way when you ask MAGA Republicans today, what does woke mean? They falter. Ned Price, a former CIA analyst, dubbed it a hashtag in search of scandal. skip down here a little bit you know I, I really recommend you guys to find this article and and take a look at it yourself if I can remember I'll put it down in the description um, I'm gonna jump down here though so the article says I've jumped down a few paragraphs it says there are a few reasons argues set mayor host of the honestly speaking podcast first off Donald Trump has a problem where I think he's just jealous of the fact that President Obama is still so admired I'm gonna pause there there's something with narcissists, and this happens from the people who run entire nations, you know, down to everyday individuals, narcissists in general. They don't have true empathy or compassion, and it has something to do with their adverse childhood experiences, you know. I think that there is a little boy in there, and Donald Trump, that's searching for daddy's approval, you know. And, 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 and maybe his parents had no business having kids. Thank goodness that Fred Trump, you know, Mary Trump's dad, had the good enough sense to kind of go in a different way from this sadistic, narcissistic, bigoted type of, you know, the winner at all cost behavior. But some people have no business having kids if they don't, if they can't give them the right compassion and love and empathy that they need. And that was not instilled in Donald Trump. Narcissists don't have that real empathy. Someone like Barack Obama, who although didn't have much, was raised in a family who did give him that empathy. And this is not just rich people or poor people who get this. There are plenty of rich people whose family also gave them that love and empathy that they needed. 
But since narcissists don't have that, they come up with a formulaic thing to compensate for that, you know? They look at what people react to and what they don't react to, and they use that as their, you know, guiding light instead of actual human compassion. So let's keep going. Number two, I think he has a problem with people of color who are in authority that don't do the kind of song and dance that he wants them to do. It says in quote from this podcast, Barack Obama is not a shuck and jive person of color. And those are the kinds of people that Donald Trump seems to be attracted to if you look at who he surrounds himself with as far as minorities are concerned. I have a feeling most of the minorities who surround themselves around Donald Trump are likely the ones who are in it for nefarious reasons. So it says, third, Seth Meyer points to the 2011 White House Correspondents Association dinner where Trump sat stony faced and humiliated as Obama lampooned the Celebrity Apprentice host's nascent political ambitions. Obama even pointed to a photoshopped image of a Trump White House with hotel, casino, golf course, and gold columns. It says, a lot of people think that this is where this all started, Set Mayor continued. President Trump does not have a sense of humor. Another quality of a narcissist. They, they aren't self-deprecating. Um, Set Mayor continued, he's not self-deprecating. And the White House Correspondents' Dinner is a fun event where people make fun of each other, especially in politics. They don't understand that, you know. Donald Trump has such a fragile, fragile ego that he can't sit there and be at a fun event where it's where you are supposed to be roasted. It's where people are supposed to roast you. Barack Obama had the same thing. He had to sit through the same, th same thing. He laughed it off, you know. But Donald Trump can't do that, you know. This is not a normal human being. Rashad Robinson, president of Color of Change, a civil rights advocacy group, said the obsession, of course, is absolutely rooted in racism. Some of the accusations have been deeply radicalized, from the questioning of Obama's intelligence to talking about how much basketball he plays to questioning his birthplace and citizenship. Now listen to this here. I'm looking for it, but I can't see it. But I can just go ahead and tell you, essentially, Trump tweeted about Barack Obama over 3,000 times between, I think it was 2016 and 2021. Don't quote me on that exact figure. I'm trying to find it in the article because we just don't have time to read the whole thing. But, um, yeah, like thousands of times Donald Trump tweeted about Barack Obama between a five-year period. Can you imagine that, you know? Can you imagine that? I think that Biden is doing it now because of the absurdity of Donald Trump. But could you imagine Barack Obama tweeting a bunch of times about George W. Bush? Or could you imagine George W. Bush writing a bunch of MySpace comments thousands of times about Bill Clinton? It just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen with people who process emotions normally. This is not a normal man. He's not mentally fit. Right now, he wants to project that Biden is not mentally fit for office. Donald Trump is not mentally fit. This comes back to Obama. This comes back to Obama. This comes back to systemic racism and hating seeing black and brown people have a certain level of power.